Self-driving is absolutely the future of vehicles here in India. I don't care what the naysayers think. A lot of people don't believe that this is actually possible, that it can't happen on Indian roads because of the chaotic nature of the way that traffic moves in this country. But I think that it will. And I think it'll happen maybe in the next five years. It might even take 10 years, but it's definitely going to happen. And this is irrespective of whether or not there are painted lines on the roads or markers designating what you're supposed to do. It doesn't matter how many cows or stray dogs or crowds of people walk in front of the vehicle or speed breakers and potholes or auto wallace turning right without checking where they're going, I think that AI and specifically computer vision are still going to be able to handle these kinds of situations. And there's one startup, one Indian company that is tackling this challenge, this problem and building this technology head on. And that company is minus zero. And they just launched something really exciting. They had their Z Day event this week and launched something that they're calling the Z Pod, which is a self-driving vehicle intended for passenger transportation. Now, you won't see these Z pods on the roads of India anytime soon because these pods are more of slow speed vehicles that you'd see in, say, a tech park or a college campus. It's not really ready to navigate Indian traffic just yet. And I also don't really think that they're going to be selling these Z pods commercially, or maybe they will in a limited capacity. But this is probably more of a technology showcase to get people excited about the progress that Minus Zero is making. And they are indeed making a ton of progress. So I want to show you where this company started so that we can understand how far they've already come. This was their first technology showcase, basically a rigged up Jugad auto rickshaw with a laptop AI controlling it. And the founder of Minus Zero, Gagandeep Rihal, actually told me about their story over a podcast, and they have come a long way since then. They've been able to go from that to this. It's absolutely incredible and well done to the team over at Minus Zero for accomplishing so much in sh such a short span of time. And I can't wait to see where things go in the future. All right, next up, you guys showed a tremendous response to the course that we announced in last week's news video. So big thanks to everybody who clicked on the link in the description and waitlisted for this course that we're launching. It's the first that we're doing and we're really excited about it. We're doing a lot of crazy behind the scenes stuff to make this happen. We're super excited to have experienced CAs and lawyers participating in this live course. And just as a refresher, if you're a startup founder or you're planning on starting up someday, then this is definitely for you, especially if you feel like you might have some knowledge gaps when it comes to startup compliance, regulations, taxation, the legal side of business, all of that stuff. Most of us, I mean, let's be honest, right? Most of us don't like to actually think about those things on a day-to-day -day basis. We just wanna build our businesses, right? But it's important to know about these things so you don't get blindsided as you're building your company. So if you're interested, the wait list, the, the form that you can fill out will actually still be live until Monday. So you can find that in the description of this video. Go ahead and click on that if you're interested in being a part of this live course. Now we have had some people reach out about the pricing specifically, which is completely understandable. And I know that's gonna be an important factor in the decision that a lot of people make of whether or not this course is for them or not. We'll be sharing more information about the pricing with people who have waitlisted very soon. But in the meantime, I will tell you that it is going to be on the pricier side. This is a professional course being taught by professional CAs and lawyers, like I said, and we need to compensate those people who are going to be taking time out of their days to teach these modules. Now, to give you a bit of information about the modules so that you can decide whether or not this is actually going to be worth the money and just so you know, it definitely is. This is going to be comprehensive, extensive, but I'll just go into a little bit of detail here. So we're going to have modules on starting a company, international and domestic taxation, various laws and regulations, funding and valuations, and different kinds of agreements, including ESOPs, founders agreements, and term sheets as well. So again, if you're interested in being a part of this first cohort of this first course of Backstage with Millionaires, then you can find a link to the form in the description of this video. That form will be live only until Monday mid night. So make sure to check it out if you're interested before then. And also we'll be giving updates on more information, more specifics around the course mid of next week. All right, next up, we've been quiet on this topic for a little while because we wanted to see how things would play out. But now I think it's time to talk about Rahul Yadav. So for anybody who is out of the loop here, Rahul Yadav is an Indian startup founder best known for starting housing.com back in 2012. It was one of the hottest tech startups back in the day. But then things got a little bit crazy when he said, 
sent this to his investors and board members. You can pause the video if you want to read that, but basically it's a rude resignation letter, which he later retracted and apologized for. But just a couple of months later, Rahul, who was 26 at the time, was fired from his own company. Why? Well, the board believed that his behavior wasn't befitting of a CEO and was detrimental to the company, which is obvious to anybody who read that letter, but Rahul wasn't done. After his time at housing.com was over, he went ahead and started another company called Intelligent Interfaces, and this was actually backed by some pretty big hitters. You had Flipkart's Bunsels, you have Raj Singh's private equity venture, and reportedly even Paytm's Vijay Shikhar Sharma and Rahul Sharma of Micromax as well. But that startup didn't actually end up going anywhere, which leads us to his next venture, which he started in 2020, 4B Networks, better known as Broker Network. So Broker Network was aiming to solve a very important problem specifically for construction project developers, because these developers often struggle to find buyers for their new projects. So BN's offering is bringing together developers and prospective buyers, and they would do this through a network of brokers, hence the name Broker Network, and a little bit more on that later on. So on this idea, 4B Networks was able to raise 90 crore rupees from InfoEdge, and that number ended up going up to 276 crore rupees over multiple trenches. But then things started to go south because 4B Networks was burning a lot of that money rather quickly. So here's where Broker Network went wrong. They were paying brokers 300 rupees for every visitor that they would bring to a developer's project site. This was the incentive that they were offering to brokers. And as it turns out, most of these brokers were just taking advantage of the company by bringing family and friends who were pretending to be interested prospective buyers. And then they could pocket up to 1500 rupees an hour. Now, obviously this wasn't creating the value that Broker Network was intending to create for these developers. And so what would end up happening is that after a developer realized that most of the people visiting their sites weren't actually valuable customers, they weren't interested buyers, they would just stop using Broker Network altogether. So not surprisingly, 4B Networks ended up reporting a loss of 57.9 crore rupees in FY22. And this wasn't all just because of the fees that they were paying to brokers. There were a couple of other missteps, for example, hiring employees at really high salaries, way above market rate. They were just burning through money really quickly. There was also a murky acquisition. There were some other loss making business activities, but basically red flags all around. And so it shouldn't come as any surprise that in February of 2023, InfoEdge announced that they had written off their investment into 4B Networks as a loss. Now, at the time, they said that this was in light of market conditions and uncertainty towards funding options for the startup, which wouldn't prompt any further investigation or scrutiny normally if this was any other startup. This is pretty normal stuff. High burn rates and unsustainable business models end up leading to companies that just can't sustain themselves long term. And in a bear market, it's really hard to raise funding. And so that makes a lot of sense. But then some information started coming out. For example, people were shocked to find out that 4B Networks was running out of money to the point where they hadn't paid 150 employees since November of 2022. And that's pretty bad in and of itself. But if you actually look at the lifestyle that Rahul Yadav is living, and this is alleged, we don't actually know if any of this is true. It could just be some kind of smear campaign. I don't know. But the rumor is that he's living a pretty luxurious life. While 150 employees went unpaid, Rahul's in a Maybach and renting a boardroom at Taj Land's End for 80,000 rupees per day. So all of this has prompted InfoEdge to launch an investigation into 4B Networks, basically an audit conducted by Deloitte to find out whether this is the case of just a struggling startup with an unsustainable business model, or if there's something more sinister going on here. And I typically give founders and startups the benefit of the doubt, but in this situation, InfoEdge has actually made several information requests of the company, and those requests have gone ignored. So they haven't been able to see what's going on inside of the company, and that definitely doesn't bode well for 4B Networks because it's actually a violation of their shareholders agreement with InfoEdge. At this point, I think it's safe to say that most of India's startup ecosystem has turned against Rahul Yadav. And here's a LinkedIn post from Amit Gupta. He actually wrote a great post saying that Yadav's journey shows a pattern of starting companies, raising funds, and then shutting them down in a year or two. Sometimes it's bad luck and sometimes it's Rahul Yadav. And I'll just wrap this news item up with one of Rahul's Facebook posts from 2019, where he's laughing about soft Bank's bad boys, of which he, of course, is one of them with housing.com. And I guess this was a little bit of foreshadowing. All right, next up, Sequoia India is rebranding to Peak 15 Partners. Peak 15 was the original name given to Mount Everest, is what their website says. And I just want to add one line here, which is, 
by the British. That's the original name given by the British. Obviously not the original, original name of the mountain given by local people who consider the mountain to be sacred and holy. Two British guys just showed up. They wanted to measure the height of the mountain and they just called it Peak 15 because the local names were probably too hard for them to pronounce. And then, you know, later on this VC firm comes along and says, we're gonna call ourselves by that. And that's the original name. I think to put this in context for Indian people, you know, if imagine British people showed up and found this river and they said to the local people, what's it called? And the local people said, oh, it's called Ganga. And then the British just said, okay, we're just gonna call this river 12 because it's way easier to pronounce than Ganga. And then a hundred years later, a VC firm says, we're going to call ourselves River 12 because that's the original name of the river. I just, you know, I think uh, maybe add one line by the British and then <laughs> nobody will misinterpret this as the original name of the mountain. The oldest name that I could find on the internet was the Tibetan name Mount Chumalungma. And I'm, I'm probably butchering that, but at least I'm trying. But <laughs> apparently it's too difficult for VCs to pronounce. But anyways, why are they rebranding? Well, this is actually a global effort from Sequoia to simplify their international footprint. So they're rebranding Sequoia China to Hongshan. And according to their website, this is being done to mitigate brand confusion and portfolio conflict. But apart from the rebranding, this actually goes quite a bit deeper because Peak 15 is going to be operating independently, which is both a good thing for them and also a bit of a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. It's a good thing because now Peak 15 will be able to make unilateral decisions. They won't have to run things past Sequoia in the United States first, but it's also a bad thing because it might actually make raising funds from LPs a little bit more difficult because they're no longer underneath the very well established and trusted brand of Sequoia. This might also affect our current fund of $2.85 billion, which they raised in 2022, because LPs gave them that money when they were underneath the Sequoia brand, but now that they aren't, will LPs be fine with letting them keep the money, especially during this funding winter, or will they ask for that money back? Well, we're just gonna have to wait and see. All right, next up, and I almost wanted to lead the news episode with this news, but we've been talking too much about Baiju's lately, so I decided to put it near the end. Baiju's is actually suing their lenders. And not only that, but they've stopped paying their interest payments on this massive loan that they've taken out. And they're also gonna be firing about a thousand people. So things are really looking bad for Baiju's right now. So the lender in question here, Redwood, had actually accelerated Baiju's repayment of the $1.2 billion that Baiju's owes them. And this is because Baiju's had allegedly violated the terms of the loan by delaying their financial filings. And that's a fact, they did delay the financial filings but Baiju's didn't like this acceleration. They called it a predatory practice and it's why they're suing Redwood now. But here's the interesting part. Baiju's has now stopped paying their interest payments on this loan because they're saying that until the courts decide, these payments are in dispute. So they feel that they're not obligated to make the loan payments that they had originally agreed to pay, which to me, feels like it could go either way, right? If the court rules in Baiju's favor, then maybe this will all kind of be swept under the rug and they won't have to end up paying those interest payments or they can pay them later on or something will happen. But it could also be a ticking time bomb and Baiju's is sort of kicking this really dangerous can down the road. And eventually, once the court rules in Redwood's favor, if it does, then there's gonna be all of these pending interest payments that Baiju's is gonna have to pay. And maybe there will even be interest on the interest payments, who knows? Now, on top of all of this, Baiju's is also laying off roughly a thousand people. And they're saying that they're gonna give all these people two months severance, but a lot of people are questioning how that's actually gonna be possible because Baiju's really seems like they're running out of money. According to an anonymous source quoted by The Morning Context, they have not paid PF contributions since October. Incentives haven't been paid since September. TDS is not reflecting since November. A Appraisal payments are still due. How do you think the company is going to manage severance payouts? All right, next up, let's move on to some funding news here. $120 million have been raised by Indian startups this week. Here's what that looks like in context. And the leader this week was Healthify Me, which was co-founded by Tushar Vashisht. We actually had him over at Backstage with Millionaires for a podcast. So definitely check it out. You can find a link to it in the top right corner of your screen. Fascinating story. Tons of ups and downs over the years. And these guys have raised $30 million. And then another really interesting company that raised 
raised funds this week is River. These guys are making electric two-wheelers and they look pretty cool. So this startup has an A-list team, which consists of X Aether, Arai, Bosch, Honda, Ultraviolet, and Vespa employees. And the founders of the company also have some pretty solid experience under their belts too. Aravind Mani was VP of strategy at Ultraviolet and Vipim George worked at Honda R&D in India for eight years and then served as design lead at Ultraviolet as well. Now, just to be on the safe side, I did do a reverse Alibaba image search, which I've done in the past with companies like Okinawa, and you end up finding out that these vehicles are literally identical to vehicles that are being manufactured in China, and they've been being manufactured in China. So clearly the Indian companies in these situations have just found those listings and they've reached out to those companies and imported them into India. And then they just assemble the parts in India and call it Make in India, which I think is really disingenuous. But my hope is that River is not doing anything like that. And the fact that the founders have worked at Ultraviolet makes me believe that they have the chops to actually pull this off and design, create, manufacture, or you know, assemble some pieces. Obviously, you're gonna have to import some stuff from outside of India, but my hope is that it's all happening here in India. So anyone at River watching this video, definitely let me know how much of this is happening here in India and how much is relying on imports from other countries. But anyways, that is all the funding news that I have this week. And you can find a link to the Notion. All of the funding information will be there in the description. And that's all I have for you guys. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.